Hey everybody, this is our first um, sort of lecture revisit of material after our first exams. Uh, like I said in, in class today, I'll be getting the exams up um, within the next few days, getting the exam grades within the next few days. I'm still finishing up, um, but I wanted to go ahead and jump right back in and talk about new material. So here we go. Now this new material that we're going to be starting on today is actually kind of a continuation, but it's not it's not completely or it's it it's fairly new because of the fact that we're talking about new amino acids. So previously we've talked about our charged amino acids and those are amino acids that have a positive or negative charge at a uh, physiological pH of about 7.4. Um, likewise we talked about our aromatic amino acids. Today what we're going to talk about is we're going to start out with our uncharged polar amino acids. And that group extends to the following. Threonine, THR, serine, SER, asparagine, ASN, glutamine, GLN, and finally cysteine, CYS. Okay, so all these different amino acids, well, they're actually not too tough to, to kind of get a grip on. What I'm going to show you is I'm just going to draw the R groups. So what we've got for threonine, imagine that the THR is your backbone. Um, what you've got is CH, OH, and CH3. Serine is even simpler than that. That is CH2. OH, asparagine and glutamine. Well, those names should sound somewhat familiar. And what the reason that they should sound familiar is because we've already talked about aspartic acid and glutamic acid. Well, these are asparagine and glutamine. They're very similar to aspartic acid and uh, glutamic acid, respectively. Aspar uh, asparagine looks like this, CH2, C, we've got that double bonded oxygen, but then we've got H2N. So our grouping here is very similar to our aspartic acid, but it's not a uh, carboxylic acid. Glutamine, we've got CH2, CH2, C, double bonded oxygen, and H2N. Very similar, if not, or basically identical uh, with the one variation to glutamic acid. Okay, cysteine is kind of a unique amino acid because it's very similar to that serine residue. The only difference is it has, rather than that uh, hydroxyl group, we've got a sulfhydryl group. So CH2, then dot, or dash SH. Okay, so this is the variation with that. Now, one thing that makes cysteine unique is that cysteine is capable of forming these uh, covalent bonds known as uh, disulfide bonds, or disulfide bridges, in which case the R groups of two cysteine residues basically align with one, or they, they line up. So what that would look like would be, I'm going to go ahead and draw the backbone of one group here, CH2. Here is your disulfide bond. I'm going to draw an arrow down to that. There's your disulfide bond, CH2, C. H, C, double bonded oxygen, or carboxylic acid, and then H, 3, N plus. Okay, so this is an example of a cysteine, C-Y-S-T-I-N-E. Um, that's a, well, two cysteine residues that come together. Um, these are all of your polar uncharged residues. Learning them is not too tricky, uh, just because you have a little bit of context in the aspartic acid and glutamic acid. So if you know those, you more or less know asparagine and glutamine. Um, then it just becomes learning serine and threonine. And if you know the serine residue, then you can basically deduce what the cysteine residue is. You're just going to replace that hydroxide group with a uh, sulfhydryl group. Okay, so the next group of amino acids, the next new group of amino acids are your nonpolar R groups, nonpolar AAs. And once you know these, then you know all of the amino acids that well, are important for this class, all the 20 amino acids that we will most frequently talk about. 
Oop. Erase that. Let's try that one more time. Um, okay, so your nonpolar amino acids. What I'm going to do is show them with simply their single letter codes. G for glycine, A for alanine, V for valine, L for leucine, I for isoleucine, M for methionine, and finally P for proline. Now, as these are all nonpolar residues, they're all fairly hydrophobic. Okay, so and that's important because what are they going to interact with? Now, over here, I'm going to draw just the R group. So our R group for glycine is simply a hydrogen. Alanine is simply CH3. Valine is CH. And then we've got two methyl groups coming off of that. One, two methyl groups coming off of that. Leucine is, I'm kind of taking up a little bit too much space here, so I'm going to draw this outward. Well, it's just valine, but a little bit longer. CH, CH3, CH3. Isoleucine, well, it's an isomer of leucine. Clever naming there. What we've got is C, C, and I'm going to draw that. C, H, three H two H and CH three coming off of that. Methionine is CH two CH two S. So you've got a sulfur CH three. Then finally, I'm going to draw the backbone included for proline because of the fact that your R group for proline actually uh, kind of turns back in on the uh, peptide, or I'm sorry, on the backbone. So what we've got is N, C, C. We've got our alpha carbon with a hydrogen. Now we've got one CH2, two CH2, three CH2. That third CH2 goes to our nitrogen. So now what we're going to do is put H2 plus because this nitrogen has a total of four bonds, hence it adopts a positive charge when there are two hydrogens. Because of the fact that we've got one bond going to the alpha carbon, but then another bond going to the carbon that is within our R group. Okay, so these are all of your nonpolar amino acids. If you know these, then you know basically the, the more hydrophobic residues. So most of these, if you look at them like valine, leucine, isoleucine, well, they're just hydrocarbons. And so what do they want to interact with? Well, they want to interact with other hydrocarbons. So, a uh, kind of continuation of this, and something I touched on in lecture, is a way of categorizing amino acids, and that's using something known as a hydropathy plot. And what that shows, or a hydropathy scale or plot, is it shows which amino acids are most hydrophobic. So, a range from most to least hydrophobic. Now, the amino acids that are just a bunch of carbons and hydrogens, a bunch of hydrocarbons, those are going to be your most hydrophobic. Now, those amino acids that are charged, for instance, um, like aspartic acid, ASP, or glutamic acid, GLU, those are going to be least hydrophobic. Most hydrophobic would be something like this, this and this. Okay, so those are your most compared to your least hydrophobic amino acids. So it's important to recognize those because ultimately when we start talking about protein structure and different domains within proteins, we'll talk about hydropathy and or we'll talk about hydrophobicity and everything like that and how it pertains to protein structure. Now, the last thing that I wanted to do was I just wanted to go ahead and draw a peptide in part because uh, draw a peptide as well as draw the uh, uh, I'm sorry draw the titration curve for that peptide and so what I would like to do and the one that I did in class was hats h-a-t-s a histidine alanine threonine serine um, but for this what I want to do is I want to go ahead and write let's see what's a good peptide um, proline alanine leucine pal you're your friend or yeah a 
P-A-I-L would be like a bucket or something. So let's do pal. Okay, so what does this look like? The exact same way that we start every single um, peptide, we are going to start with N, C, C, N, C, C, N, C, C. We're drawing this at a pH of 1. <laughs> what we've got is our C termini fully protonated. Each of our R groups, or I'm sorry, each of our alpha carbons has a single hydrogen. Alpha carbon, alpha carbon. Our peptide bonds have carbonyl groups, or carbonyl carbons, and a nitrogen with a hydrogen on it. And there we go. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump right into drawing proline. Remember, proline is CH2, 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 then that goes to your N termini or your, uh, yeah, your N termini of your peptide. How many hydrogens do you need to draw in order to show that as being fully protonated? Only two. Okay. Now, alanine. So this basically takes care of our pro. Okay, so proline's taken care of. Then what we need to do is go on to draw our alanine. Alanine is simply the next alpha carbon with a CH3. Alanine's done. After that, leucine. Leucine is CH2. CH. I got two methyl groups coming off of it. H3C. CH3. Okay, so now when it comes to evaluating what does this actually look like, and whenever we have a, uh, like in terms of the charge as well as drawing a titration curve for it, what groups can be protonated and deprotonated? Well, we've got this group right here, our C termini, and our N termini. One misconception is that lots of people will look at this and say, oh, well, this is a, uh, an R group that's got a positive charge. No, it's not. It's actually just the N termini. So proline, the R group is uncharged. Alanine, the R group is uncharged. Leucine, the R group is uncharged. So ultimately, at a pH of 1, we have a charge, an overall charge, of plus 1, despite there being three amino acids. Now, what does that look like in terms of our titration curve? Likewise, what does this look like for our pKa values? The C termini, that's going to be a pKa of, let's call it 2.1. The N termini, that's going to be a pKa of, let's say that that is about um, 10.1. Okay. Now, you'll be given these actual values on any sort of exam or anything like that, but we have two groups that we need to worry about. Now, our y-axis for our titration curve is going to be pH, and I'm just going to speed things along, and I'm going to say pK, pH of 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, then... On our x-axis, we've got 0 0.5, 1.0, 1 1.5, 2.0. That's a dot. And these are OH equivalents. So what we have here are two points that we need to be concerned with. That 2.1 and the 10.1. The 2.1 is going to align with the 0 0.5 mark because that represents 50% of this C termini is protonated and 50% is deprotonated. Next is 1.5. Where is that? That's going to be our next pKa value. And that's going to be right about there, showing that 50% of the N termini is protonated, 50% of the N termini is deprotonated. So all that we need to do is just draw a titration curve that looks like such. There we go. And we're donezo. Okay. So that's the entirety of our titration curve here. What you need to be able to do, however, is use this to come up with some numbers. For instance, what is our PI? Well, our PI is our... our by definition, it's the point at which our molecule has a zero charge overall. This is kind of easy because we only have two pKa values. We have 2.1 and 10.1. So our PI is calculated 10.1 plus 2.1 equals 12.2. So 12.2 divided by 2 equals 
6.1. So our PI for this peptide is 6.1. Now that's kind of all there is to it. So make yourself some fairly simple peptides, be able to draw those, be able to draw a titration curve from them, and be able to extract a little bit of information about that. Um, this is kind of a an easy peptide because it's going to go from a positive one charge to zero to a negative one charge. This peptide's never going to adopt a two, positive two charge or a negative two charge because your C termini, that can become negative, and your N termini can have no charge whatsoever. So that'll about wrap it up. All right, thank you for watching. Have a good one.